my father is an impulsive man. He's never one to think things through. He makes passionate and impractical decisions all the time. To this day, at 86, he's a handsome man, a Paul Newman type with a twinkle in his eye. My mother says, he's the best looking person in the family, and there's no dispute as my brother and sister and I nod our heads in agreement. His charm and looks have served him well throughout life. My dad was a high school English teacher outside of Boston. It was a perfect job for a man who loves to talk and to entertain. In his classroom, he had set and captive audiences who no doubt looked at him in awe while waiting and wondering what was going to come out of this man's mouth next. A class scheduled about Romeo and Juliet could be sidelined by an hour dissertation about his tennis game. <laughs> Having lost his only brother to a sniper bullet late in World War II, my dad was vehemently opposed to any war. During the Vietnam War era, he went on a mission to keep young men away from war. He promoted the educational deferment to his students, and he would proclaim to his classes, everybody here is going to college. He literally kept stacks of Bunker Hill Community College applications in his desk drawer. These were for the students who were not necessarily college bound. My dad would write the application, track down the student to have them sign them, and then my dad would mail them in. He did everything in his power to prevent anyone from being drafted. Life is a performance piece for my dad. He sees himself as always being on stage. When he steps off an airplane or into a room, he starts to dance thinking, this is my entrance. The man lives for an audience. Growing up with a one-man show was forever entertaining as well as exhausting. Our dinners were insane with my dad acting out his day, reciting poetries and singing songs. No one could get a word in. It was all about him. I did look at him in awe because he made life so alive, but there was no space for anyone else. As a kid, I often hibernated in my room with dozens of stuffed animals just to get some peace and quiet and to be on my own in my own world where no one spoke. <laughs> As an adult, I needed not to be Bob Horn's daughter, so I moved cross country. This was over 20 years ago, and at times I still feel guilty for abandoning my parents, but it's all my guilt. At 55 years old, my dad retired. He claimed that he would pick up other jobs, but his attention deficit disorder always led him to run out wild, look for new audiences and new adventures. His escape vehicle was his bike. He started out on loose group trips, the main one, Ragbri, an annual bike race across the state of Iowa, and talk about a marketing coup. This ride is a combination Burning Man, Woodstock, and Outward Bound in <laughs> Iowa. <laughs> My dad would drive the 1,200 miles out there, bike 500 miles and party, and then drive the 12 miles, 1,200 miles home. It was a mecca for him, and Boston Bob was a fixture at Ragbri for many years. When there wasn't a group trip, he would go solo. His trips are legendary and impressive in their complete insanity. One August, my brother was driving from Boston to Arizona to school. My dad gamely went along with his bike. In the middle of nowhere in Texas, he said, pull over, this looks good. He got out on his bike and started pedaling east towards Boston. My brother continued driving west while looking in the rearview mirror while watching him get smaller and smaller. On this trip, he bragged that he slept in cemeteries because they were quiet and safe, and no one was going to bother you in a cemetery. <laughs> Over a thousand miles later, a thousand miles, the man ended up in Chicago before he got tired and hopped a flight home. On impulse, he would bring home new used cars, random gadgets, and periodically dogs. Our dogs were treasured members of the family and lived long and happily lives, mainly because we were all home to look after the dog. My dad found the family's new dog at the pound. He claimed that he was simply stopping by to say hello to the dogs, and then, without hesitation, without consulting his wife, without thinking of any consequences, the man with the attention span of a gnat picked up a fluffy one, Coco, and brought him home. Like my dad, Coco was beautiful. He stopped traffic. This was in the 90s, pre-designer animals. By today's standards, he would have a $3,000 price tag and be called a purebred golden doodle. <laughs> he had the fluff, the sachet, the complete rock star attitude, and he was also a loose cannon. With my dad and Coco, the planets had aligned for these two kindred, unleashed characters to come together. No one knew who was leading who around or who was more out of control. <laughs> When the snow melted and the roads cleared, my dad was off again. Newfoundland was calling, so he decided to bike there, 967 miles. My mom was in charge, but she worked full time. 
Coco was left home alone. There was no fence, no borders, no boundaries, no supervision. And in harmony with my father's life, no one ever said no to Coco. He went where he wanted to go, when he wanted to go, and would do whatever he wanted to do. It was a miracle the dog came home at night. Unfortunately for my father and for Coco, good looks and charm can't cover bad behavior. Coco's life crashed first. Coco was off leash. He tangled with a neighbor, walking her dog on leash. She got knocked down, smacked her face. A trip to the hospital was needed. The police were called. Coco's world crumbled. He was now wanted by the law. <laughs> Coco was in serious, serious trouble. Coco was sent to the vet until things got sorted out. Things got messy fast. The injured neighbor refused any apology and directed all communication to their lawyer. The neighbor wanted immediate action. The, they petitioned around the neighborhood for Coco to be put down, and not one neighbor signed. The injured party was not deterred. She wanted the death penalty for Coco, and she went back to the police and the vet in further attempts to get Coco put down. No one budged. As a family, it was decided Coco needed to get out of Dodge. <laughs> My dad broke Coco free and headed north to Maine. We all knew that Coco needed to go far away or he'd try to come home to find us. The hope was that a friend or a friend of a friend, or honestly, anyone in the state of Maine would take Coco. <laughs> as charming as my dad is, and he's incredibly charming, it was beyond even his capabilities to give away a dog with a pending lawsuit. <laughs> Back he came with Coco. Both my parents were defeated, emotionally exhausted, and nervous as ticks. As the youngest, I'm the fixer in the family, and I wanted to give them a break. My brother and I were living 3,000 miles away in California, so I called him and said, Robert and I will take Coco for a while. An hour later, Coco was booked on American Airline Flight 186, <laughs> landing in San Diego at 2.10 the next day. <laughs> Robert and I lived in an apartment. We had no yard and no idea if dogs were allowed, but we were game. We became a dog tag team and took turns running miles with him around Crown Point, taking him to Doggy Beach, bringing him with us everywhere. Coco had a lovely break and adapted really well to life in Southern California. <laughs> Six months later, the coast was clear and Coco's lawsuit settled for $80,000. <laughs> My parents made assurances to their dismayed homeowner's insurance agent that Coco would be secured in the yard with an electric fence. Coco finally had set boundaries. The reality was the boundaries calmed him down. He had structure and along with age, Coco mellowed. My dad was late in getting any boundaries. At age 65, and after 42 years of marriage, he left my mom and Coco and dismantled our family. His goodbye letter was written on a napkin left on the kitchen table stating, moving north. He found a new audience in a younger woman. When he left, it broke us all. I took a time out and didn't speak to him for three years. I traveled to faraway places and found happiness with my own adventures. My silence to my dad was my power. It was the only thing I could control with him, and it was also my punishment to him. But as in life, time helped, time healed. My anger and hurt shrunk, and love and forgiveness prevailed. My dad's relationship with his girlfriend didn't last, but he was happy with other new audiences and new freedoms. He didn't have a care in the world. He reveled in the fact that he had no responsibilities, not even to himself. He refused to take any medication. His high spirits and energies and passions also brought high blood pressure. After six many strokes, his brain was altered. My dad now lives in an assisted living dementia unit. Even in his current state, he talks to anyone within reach and he entertains the other residents by playing the piano and singing songs. He cheats at bingo so he can give the prizes to the ladies. <laughs> he still believes he's on stage. Just the other day he called and he said, I'm going to sing you a song and I want you to record it. I played along and gave him the go ahead to start singing. He then proceeded to sing Danny Boy. I wish I did know how to record it because he really is a beautiful singer. When he was done, he gave me permission to post it on YouTube and generously told me to keep whatever money it earned. <laughs> I'm happy to hear his voice whenever he calls. He tells me that when the snow melts, he is getting out of there, breaking free. He plans to put his Vespa and his bike back on the road and he will be mobile again. But his boundaries are set. His days of roaming are done. Coco lived until 16 and we still talk in awe about his adventures and his wild spirit. My dad, secured and confined in his new home, still sings, talks, writes stories, 
and dreams about leaving convention and responsibility behind to go on new adventures. In his world, he is forever unleashed. Van Christheimer, Peter Schreier.